The Institute of World Affairs at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee presents International Focus, a weekly discussion of the people and events behind today's global headlines. Support provided by Milwaukee Public Television and the UWM Center for International Education. Now here's your host, Doug Savage. Welcome to International Focus. Recent images of bodies of refugees drowned in a desperate attempt to cross the Mediterranean to Europe have shocked the world. According to the International Organization for Migration, the death toll among those attempting to reach Europe has climbed almost tenfold. A leading country of origin for these refugees, and sadly, of a disproportionate number of fatalities, is the African nation of Eritrea. Following a decades-long war for independence that formally ended in 1993, the nation was plunged almost immediately into new conflicts with Yemen and its old adversary, Ethiopia. The resulting government has established a pattern of authoritarian behavior and human rights violations that are driving the dangerous exodus of citizens across the sea. Here to explain how Eritrea's people fit into the complex multinational plight of cross-Mediterranean refugees, we're joined by Fesahe Mabratu, Eritrean-born executive director of the Pan-African Community Association. Since its founding in 1998 as a small committee to support African immigrants in the Milwaukee metro area, it has greatly expanded its programming and now serves as a full-service refugee resettlement agency. Mr. Mabratu has just returned from meetings at the White House dealing with the current refugee crisis. Sahih Mabratu, welcome to International Focus. Thank you, Doug, for inviting me. This is a very crucial time for uh, the Eritreans in the diaspora and the back home. Uh, first, I would like to uh, express my sympathy to all those people who uh, lost uh, the atrocities, both in the Mediterranean Sea, as well as those who were killed in Libya, as well as in South Africa, uh, almost in all these three countries or three places, the Eritreans have been, as you said, disproportionately represented there. I also would like to express uh, my sympathy to the rest of the people who died there, their family and their loved ones. This is not an easy situation. Uh, it's a human uh, tragedy that could be avoided, but uh, here we are. And thank you for inviting me to uh, share my experience and my view about the situation. Well, thank you for joining us. And maybe we could start with a little bit of uh, sort of Eritrean history 101, if you will. It, it's a country that maybe uh, some of our viewers are not familiar with. Well, uh, Eritrea is like other parts of Africa, is the creation of the scramble for Africa. Uh, historically, as a people, we always existed there as part of the greater um, Horn of Africa, or Ethiopia, and the uh, Red Sea area, we existed for centuries and uh, thousands of years as as a people, you know, of diverse cultural background, but always uh, lived side by side in a different lifestyle. However, after 1884, the scramble for Africa. Eritrea was given to Italy, and Italy was able to carve a territory and name it Eritrea after the Mar Eritreum, which is the Red Sea. And so here comes a new territory no, known as Eritrea. Uh, from 1890s until nine, uh, 1941, Italy controlled uh, Eritrea. Uh, also used as a staging ground to invade Ethiopia in 1935. However, by 1941, when Italy lost the war uh, and was kicked out from uh, Ethiopia and Eritrea, and Eritrea remained under British protectorate until 1952, then was federated with Ethiopia uh, from 1952 until 1961. However, the federation uh, with Ethiopia did not last long, 
and Prophet Haile Selassie uh, did away uh, with the Federation and annexed Eritrea, which uh, ensued uh, an armed struggle from 1961 until 1991. This 30 years of war has been very brutal. A lot of uh, lives were lost. Uh, you know, the future of the generation was uh, cut short, but we were very hopeful when in 1991 uh, Eritrean uh, Liberation uh, Fronts or the Eritrean People's Liberation Front won the war in tandem with the Ethiopian uh, uh, opposition groups that overthrew the uh, Mangusta Haile Mariam, the Derg or the Marxist regime. So for a few years, there was a harmony between Ethiopia and Eritrea. Ethiopia allowed for Eritrea to conduct a referendum for, for independence in 1993. Eritrea uh, did a national referendum whether to remain with Ethiopia or to be independent. Uh, the, definitely the uh, people's wish was to become independent and was succeeded and joined uh, the world nations in 1993. Uh, to be exact, it was uh, April 1993 and independence was uh, proclaimed on June, I mean, May 24, 1993. That is the short history. Uh, from 1993 until 1998, Ethiopia and Eritrea, uh, as a people, we don't know the political undercurrents, but it was probably the best time. You know, we forgot all the wars and the conflicts. We lived side by side as great neighbors. And in 1998, a war uh, in the uh, started, which was not expected by the people. Uh, the eruption was a small area called Badme, where a uh, flash point, a border war, uh, Eritrea claiming and Ethiopia claiming the same uh, place. But the two years, 1998 to 2000, the, 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 the lives lost would be probably the same number of people that we lost in the 30 years war. That was a trench warfare, and this is probably the most devastating war we can ever, it was senseless. By 2000, uh, um, probably uh, Ethiopia had the upper hand and uh, eventually there was a peace accord, and in order to demarcate uh, the border, uh, by 2001 or 2002, uh, we, we hope that it uh, would be demarcated. Uh, Ethiopia presented a precondition because the flashing point was uh, awarded to Eritrea, and Ethiopia did not like it. Eritrea also lost some other territories. Ethiopia wanted to renegotiate but uh, Eritrea said it should be final, and uh, Eritrea felt that it has an upper hand on on the on, on because one place <laughs> that was the flashing point was awarded to it. So that was where they felt victory, though militarily they lost. Uh, however, the quagmire is on this negotiating the details. From 2000 on, the Eritrean regime started. Uh, clamping on its opposition groups, started jailing them, and closed all uh, free presses that was uh, emerging. Not only that, also closed religious uh, newspapers that were about 75, 80 years old, that pre-exist even the creation of Eritrea. As a result, <clears throat> the government said that Eritrea uh, is under threat from Ethiopia. So everybody, every able body has to be enlisted, which the military conscription was in existence since the, the independence of Eritrea. But after the war with, with the border war with Ethiopia, it became one way. You go there, the 18 man that was in the proclamation never mattered. 
and basically every adult, young adult from 18 until four years old, 40 years old, man or woman, are supposed to be serving in the military. And in fact, this is driving a lot of the uh, the exodus from the country, right? I mean, uh, young people just see that, that that is their future where you're constri constricted into uh, service with an open-ended date, right? There's no, no sense of when you might get out. Exactly, exactly. The, the old fighters were demobilized during the border war and everybody else that joined the military service afterwards never had the chance to go out. Sometimes even when you have medical reasons. For example, uh, we do have in Eritrea over 400,000 standing army and a, a nation which is <clears throat> less than four million people, if so. This disproportion to its uh, economic development, human capital and everything. And the young people who are in the military service are doing hard labor, s slave labor type, working in gold mines, building roads but that take to nowhere. Uh, working uh, in plantations and farms, sometimes even building homes for the military officers and so on and so forth. This is the life uh, they see and they are not even given any salary except pocket money and some of them are heads of families. How are they going to support their family with this type of, and this is indefinite, they have been there 15, 20 years, so the way out is to abandon uh, the military and go to uh, take refuge wherever they, they can in face of uh, death and other uh, uh, adversities. So uh, we've got just a few minutes before our break, but let's talk a little bit about how that happens. If, if I'm in Eritrea and I've decided the only solution for my family is to just get out, what happens next? What do I do? Well, there are... Uh, of course, Eritrea is surrounded by Sudan to the west, Ethiopia to the south. Uh, the Ethiopian side is very heavily fortified, so the soldiers are ordered to shoot to kill anybody crossing. So we hear a lot of people died crossing the border. So even leaving the country is very dangerous. To the Sudan, similar da danger, but it's also a desert. So is they have to be uh, strong and have been prepared to be able to cross the desert, even to go to the next city. Those are the things. However, in this kind of situation, then human smugglers thrive. Sometimes, allegedly, military officers of the government are also benefiting from this uh, human tragedy. They are the smugglers, they are the ones who uh, take the money, even sometimes they would uh, ask you to wire the money from the capital. So those are the, 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 the so complicated situation, but people are running away into every direction they are able to go, regardless what the danger is going to face them, you know, uh, ahead. For example, Ethiopia is, they fought the war with Ethiopia, but Ethiopia is the refuge place for the majority of Eritreans who are immediately outside of the country. That in itself is an irony. There's so, a paradox there, but at the same time also, you have to understand the politics and the, and, and the people who are the same uh, on the other side of the, of the border. So there are large camps just over the border in, in Ethiopia. Yeah, there are at least three or four uh, camps overflowing. Well, uh, well, we'll continue the story of how ultimately uh, people find themselves on the sea, uh, but first we'll take a short break. We'll be back. The Institute of World Affairs presents our community with a range of public programs relating to global issues, U.S. foreign policy, and the world economy. For more information about the Institute of World Affairs, call 414 229-3220 or visit our website at www.iwa.uwm.edu
Welcome back. Well, before our break, we were talking about uh, sort of the beginning of the journey of a, a, an Eritrean refugee crossing the border. Uh, I think we've, we've got a map of some of the other uh, routes that refugees are taking to, uh, to get to the Mediterranean. So you're saying, uh, you know, many go through Sudan. Uh, this, this map ends a bit further to the west, but uh, there's also an eastern route now through Sinai, isn't there? Yes, uh, the, the direction towards uh, Europe and Israel was uh, at one point uh, through Sinai into Israel. Uh, that probably is the story that has not been told enough because the Bedouin uh, were taking them hostages and use, uh, taking their, harvesting their organs for sale. And many Eritreans and Sudanese uh, were uh, killed there as a result. However, the biggest route or probably the most um, uh, traveled route is the one through Libya. And they take from Sudan uh, most of the time either by uh, trucks or on foot. They cross the desert and a lot of people die on the way because of thirst or hunger or sunstroke and everything. Um, until uh, the Gaddafi was in power, the n number of uh, refugees crossing to Italy, especially Eritreans, was limited because there was, I uh, think, an agreement between Italy and uh, Gaddafi to hold as many uh, of them as possible. But after the fall of Gaddafi, uh, Libya was not safe for not only Eritreans, who many of them happen to be Christians, also for anybody who was crossing through. So probably that's the movement that we see is because uh, Libya is no more safe. And as a result, people are trying to flee as much as possible to Europe uh, for safety. So uh, at each point then, there, there's another set of challenges. I mean, there, and people are unable to, to make it across the, the Mediterranean on their own, so they, by definition, have to deal with some trafficker. So talk a little bit about the, that last leg of the journey and who's, who's providing the, the well, boats. The, the, you have to understand, since Sudan or even from Ethiopia, there is always a human trafficker. There is a chain of human traffickers that are passing uh, like a chain from one to the other. Uh, the last leg probably uh, in, uh, in Libya is where they have to load them on, uh, on seaward the uh, boats. Uh, for Eritreans, who, though we have a long Red Sea uh, course, uh, the majority of them do not know how to s swim because they are coming mostly from the highlands uh, where come from a dry area, so we do not understand, as a people, the danger of the sea. They think you float on the boat and you will be able. You are always looking for those who made it. You are not always thinking about the people who have not made it. So some of it is ignorance, some of it is desperation. Mm -hmm. The ignorance that they don't understand the danger in the sea. Desperation is there is no other place for them to stay uh, that can start their life over again. Well, and particularly these days, uh, if, if you find yourself in Libya, the, as you were saying, this is not a viable option. You can't stay in Libya. Say. No, this is, this, is, uh, this is also another uh, issue when a failed state, uh, the legacy of dictators is a failed state, and this is the chaos that followed the fall of uh, Gaddafi, and uh, I'm sure this is where we are seeing the consequence of it. Unfortunately, that's also what scares me of the other dictatorial regimes, what is going to be next after their uh, you know, demise or the natural uh, process of changing the guard. Do, is there a viable option for, to uh, make the country stable? So. That's where we are. They are desperate to, uh, for safety, uh, hoping that they will be in Europe. Uh, for Eritreans, lately, there has been uh, a better understanding because they know 
that they are real prosecuted, uh, being prosecuted from the uh, 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 regime that doesn't care for them. So that might have also lured them to be uh, to seek for safe heaven um, when the alternative is none. So uh, the estimates vary, but so far this year, uh, the, it's something well in excess of 1,000, 1,600, 1,700 people that have perished trying to make that crossing. Uh, so what happens for the, the lucky ones who actually make it safely to the shore? What, what can they expect when they land on, uh, on the coast in Italy or in some cases Greece? Well, uh, not sure. Uh, even those who cross the it may may not have been uh, may not have the opportunity to be granted asylum so we have to understand the asylum process is not they don't give it to you pr as a group so so what is your status day 1 when you land what legally how are you seen well uh, at least you have a protection at least you are in a safe place it takes a while to process. It may take a while to know your status. At least when you are on dry land, you are in a better situation. However, let's say Italy accepts you and you are fingerprinted and your opportunity to move to other parts of the Europe seeking for a job may be very slim. So some of them don't want to be processed. They would like to go continue and get their chance to get asylum somewhere else. So there are, uh, until there is a clear policy where uh, making sure that who is an economic migrant, who is a refugee, then processing them accordingly and providing them uh, different opportunities, those type of uh, jumping the process is going to continue. But at this time, uh, yes, they are safe, but their life is no better than before because they don't know what's next. And uh, so, so how do they survive? I mean, if this is a, a protracted period while their status is being decided, what happens as a week and a month and in some cases several months go by? What, what is Usually there are camps where people are provided the basic needs and uh, some of them are in open areas, some of them are, you know, in, in fact in Switzerland uh, an old uh, monastery was provided to become uh, a refuge or a, a place for refugees because those are how um, sometimes they are sheltered. Uh, even this is uh, not only for those who just crossed the, bo the, the sea, but also those who have been uh, processed through um, the system and so on and so forth. So there is still something that the humanitarian aspect of it needs to be um, improved uh, as far as I'm concerned. But the waiting process, they are on basic needs, but some of them are also languishing in uh, the streets of Italy and other places. So. Uh, I would like to see the world to pay special attention to this kind of uh, situation because people are suffering. There's a humanitarian condition. Uh, unless we provide them at least the basic needs so that the, these people look forward to better their future, uh, I think we are just repeating what they have been uh, running away from. So uh, that, that brings up a point. I mean, ultimately, you can treat the symptoms, which is the, the people fleeing, but how do we get to the root cause of what was pushing them? Well, unfortunately, uh, and there is a political will, and there is no political will. Uh, uh, number one, the Ethiopian and Eritrean border uh, quagmire has to be resolved because the Eritrean regime is using as a pretext not to liberalize it is, uh, or to go into a uh, political process. For example, in 1997, there was uh, a constitution drafted, uh, but never been implemented. This year, on January 1st, on his New Year address, he says, the 1997 constitution is dead. I will appoint a new committee to, uh, to draft the 
a new the one to replace the one that has yeah. never been implemented. But we don't see this one as a sincere uh, democratization process. We see it just a buying time, probably trying to fool the, the rest of the world. Right now, European Union is trying to give money to uh, the Eritrean regime to uh, keep the refugees, but we have we have uh, evidence that a lot of people that have been returned by force have been detained and some of them disappeared. So we do not trust the way the government operates, but it will say whatever it wants until it, wa it gets the money to buy time and so on and so forth. So as far as I'm concerned, the root cause, at least let's take all the pretexts like the demarcation of the border and other issues that the government is seeing that as, as, a, as an obstacle to become a, a viable nation. And once we move away those, we'll see what other tricks the government comes from. But at this time, the government is hell-bent to stay in power, doesn't care about the, 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 the people or the nation-building process. All they care is about being in power until the last. Well, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you for a fascinating explanation of a situation that doesn't get enough coverage. To our viewers, we'll see you next time on International Focus. Thank you. For information about the Institute of World Affairs and its many programs, or to become a member of the Institute, call 414 229-3220 or visit us at our website.